So my name's Neil Jacobs. I'm the head of the UK Reproducibility Network's Open Research Programme. Uh, and I'm particularly excited by this because informing persuading is a topic that we've been uh, thinking about with respect to, you know, how how that's negotiated, how that's managed by researchers uh, in their work. Uh, and I'm very excited that we've been talking with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and with the story program there about the potential for hosting a story associate, so somebody who is going to use the the skills and uh, uh, and literature around story and narrative to really dig into what we might conceivably do about it. So I'm excited about this because it gives us somewhere to take the conversation that we're going to have today, obviously working with others such as uh, such as the Winton Centre and, and others on that. Um, so this is uh, the start of a conversation, which is a great place to be. Uh, I'd like to welcome our, our speakers in particular. Um, so we've got Alex Freeman, who's the Executive Director of the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication at the University of Cambridge, and is the is the driving force behind the Octopus Publishing Platform, which is a, an amazing new development for um, communicating research in a, in a better way. We've got Michael Blastland, writer and broadcaster, also at the Winton Centre, and driving force behind one of my very favourite radio programmes, which is more or less. Uh, Karen Royal Jorgensen, ex journalist, now Dean of the Research Environment and Culture at Cardiff University, and also leading on the UKRN's work to reform researcher reward and recognition. Um, Bamba Soyinka, Professor of, of Story and Chair of the Research Centre in Transcultural Creativity and Education at Bath Spa University, and Programme Director for the Story Programme, the AHR St Story Programme. And Nikki Dean, Chief Editor of Nature. Energy joined Nature in 2011 uh, and uh, has been there since. So, from a, a publisher and journal perspective, so very excited to to hear what they've got to say about informing and persuading in research communication. And I'll, with that, hand over to Alex. Thanks, Neil. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to today too. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Uh, bear with me. Hopefully, it won't go horribly wrong. Um, I've got a fairly uh, gratuitous first slide. Um, partly it's uh, nice for you all not to have to look at me all the time whilst I'm talking, but partly because I wanted to start by <clears throat> explaining where this, the think, my thinking came uh, from behind the uh, informing persuading uh, sort of dichotomy or spectrum. Because um, I used to be a documentary maker. Uh, these are the kinds of programs that I worked on. And when I made documentaries, I was, overtly telling stories and trying to make them engaging. And I thought that that was a good way to inform people. And, you know, in some respects, it probably was. Um, but really, though, deep down, I think what I was actually trying to do was to make people think what I thought as the programme maker. Um, and certainly we as programme makers used every tool that we had through, you know, choosing what was presented in the program through the editing, the scripting, the music, all of that was trying to control people's emotions and trying to shape what they thought by the end of the program or by the end of each section of the program. So we would raise questions and then answer them in the program. And that was considered good program making. And we were rewarded as program makers for things like audience engagement. Um, as well as actually whether people felt that they were learning new things. So as factual programme makers, we weren't completely beholden to, you know, everything um, had to be just as populist as possible. We did have metrics of quality and of content. But nonetheless, I wasn't working in news where I think things are different. I was working in documentaries which people primarily watch for entertainment. So we are an entertainment medium and engagement uh, was part of that. And once in a programme that I was making, we actually tried raising a question, presenting some evidence. We had interviewees who had different opinions and then we didn't resolve that to some advice and a conclusion. And the audience response was that they really didn't like that. They said, you know, we love being given the evidence, but we still want to be given the conclusion and the advice. It's not what they expected from the program. Um, so I thought that was very interesting, but it wasn't until I joined the Winton Centre at Cambridge, uh, where I work at the moment, that I really realised consciously 
for the first time that there was a very different way of communicating that doesn't try and entertain or engage people, but tries to support their decision making and giving them information for their own purposes. Um, and I, I guess as I was thinking about this, I was thinking it's, it's maybe the difference between the search engine Bing, now it's run by or uh, uh, powered by ChatGPT versus Google. You're not just given information, you're given it in a more engaging, more discursive, more narrative fashion. Um, but I think the important aspects of this truly informative kind of communication is that it serves the audience's needs, provides the information they want and need to make up their own mind, and isn't trying to persuade them to be as the, of the same mind as the communicator. As the, as the communicator, you have to be agnostic to what the audience thinks by the end of the communication. And that's what we do at the Winton Centre. We work on this um, kind of communication. We both produce it and research it. Um, and it's used in you know, decision-making in healthcare and policy-making and that kind of thing. But important things about it are markers of success, really. Um, so I think, you know, we've tried to think about what makes purely informative communication and what makes more persuasive communication. And I think there are actually sort of really fundamental differences about what you're trying to get across. Are you trying to get across information or a message? Are you trying to help people understand something or do you want them to believe it? Do you want them to change behavior or just be better informed? And do you want people to trust you or do you want to demonstrate trustworthiness? So these are the sorts of things that we at the Winton Centre think about being the difference between informative, uh, purely informative um, communication and purely persuasive communication. But having realised that distinction myself, I started thinking about the communication that I was then doing as a researcher uh, when communicating findings. And this is a typical example of what journals ask of their authors um, from one of the science journals guides. And I think it's quite typical. And it talks about things that didn't surprise me when I started um, at the Winton Centre as an academic again, thinking about getting your message across, being clear and focused, maximizing readership and citations. All of these things were what I had been trying to do when I worked in the media. And if you are trying to sell copies of a journal, if you want to be popular with readers, if you want to make things that people want to read, then this all makes sense. But I think the problem is that just as with uh, if you're working in news journalism, there's a tension between entertainment and engagement and providing information. And when we write academic articles, I think there's a tension again between how much we're trying to get across the full detailed information that somebody else would need to follow it exactly and understand what we've done and what we thought and how much we're trying to persuade them that what we found is important uh, because the more we lean towards the latter the more we focus on findings over methods and a message over information and impact over robustness and I think these are the sorts of things that then drive us inevitably into the world we're familiar with of publication bias and questionable research practices and integrity concerns and away from the world where intrinsic quality and robustness and full transparency are rewarded and incentivized, which is where I think we need to be. Uh, but this is something that I know we're going to talk about more in depth later this afternoon. Um, so I think, and I'm going to be, you know, fully overtly putting on my persuasive rather than informative hat here, this is my opinion. I think that instead of being in a world where we're all trying to persuade others to think what we think, we as researchers should maybe be trying to encourage others to think about things differently, to share what we've done and found and thought in a way that allows others to combine that information with what they know and think and come to their own and different conclusions. And I think that's how we can build in a knowledge environment. We can build on each other's work. And there's obviously a spectrum between informing, purely informing and purely persuading. And there are times when either might be appropriate, 
but I'm not sure that we as researchers, or certainly not me, I'm not always sure and aware of where I am on that spectrum and maybe where I should be on that spectrum every time I communicate. And I think I am slightly more aware of the consequences of slipping along it unintentionally. But I think that there's a lot that we're going to be able to learn this afternoon, I hope from our speakers, who are coming with more expertise than me on different types of communication with different aims and for different audiences. And I hope that over this afternoon session, we can consider what we might all do better and what we could be considering when we communicate our research. So at that point, I'm going to now hand over to our next speaker. There we are, thanks. Um, my background is mostly in journalism of the kind that means reading a lot of papers and academic argument, but I've co-authored very few papers in scholarly journals, so you can measure my relevance as you please. Um, I'm going to present a few arguments on either side of this because I think there is a defense for persuasion. And um, I'll, I'll do it very briefly necessarily in the time that we have. I will give more time to the arguments against these points about persuasion as I think that side is less familiar. Uh, plus my own position as Alex's is, is, is to mistrust persuasive devices. And I say that partly like Alex, because I come from a background in journalism, actually from news, where I don't think the persuasive devices were very much different to the ones that Alex used in documentary making. Um, and they were also considered an essential part of the craft. So I am a traitor to my tribe um, in that respect. I'm quite skeptical of the kind of things that I used to do. Um, one argument for persuasion, I think, is that it's basically all the same clay. It's just shaped differently. I'm sure you've read both those papers. And um, essentially, why wouldn't you make the best of it? Uh, this is persuasion really as rhetoric where the content remains the same. Um, it's a question of well-ordered, clear, punchy prose, maybe a little bit of a literary flair, just presentational art or skill. Um, although there's the file draw problem. We'll come back to that kind of thing in a moment. Um, and a part of that, which got, well, really goes beyond that, is that as a scholar, one of your responsibilities is the judicious selection, um, which goes with clear presentation. Part of your responsibility is to exercise judgment. You make selections of evidence, assess its rigor, use your own expertise, give emphasis, and so on. It's part of the value you bring. It's what you were trained to do. Again, why not? Um, there are a number of other arguments. It's through persuasion, this is just an, the normal way. Uh, you make a case, someone makes a counter case, you give your best, they give theirs, you critique, they critique, a bit like the adversarial system in law, this is how we get to the truth, this is how conversation goes. Um, there's an argument that you can't make the distinction at all. You just can't separate evidence in form from how we reason about and judge it. The whole thing is invalid. And there is no such thing as pure in form. I think I agree with that. Uh, it's a case of how far you can go. Um, and it's actually better if your position is apparent rather than pretending to be neutral. And there's another one really, which Alex mentioned, that nothing happens if people aren't listening. So it's the duty of any engaged researcher to try to get people's attention or you're wasting your time and the resource that was given to you in order to conduct your research. And I don't think any of these arguments is lightly dismissed. And I think in some contexts, they might be decisive. And perhaps that's something we'll get into as the afternoon goes on. Which context is this more appropriate than others? I think you know, opinion pieces, clearly more scope, uh, some others less so. And that this constitutes, in the end, a point made by Gareth and Rodri Ivalang, I think, which is that this is the de facto norm. Everybody's in the business of persuading other scientists of the importance of their ideas. This is just what we do, and the way that we do it is combining reason with rhetoric. And people will not ever put aside their interest in wanting their research to gain attention. On the other side, I think there are contexts where it's easy to see that persuasion could be problematic. Hydroxychloroquine instead of vaccination, for example. Um, clearly persuading people to do bad things or deceiving them about the efficacy of those things is not okay. But I think in these cases, is it persuasion per se that we're worried about here? Or is it just the bad content? 
And I think if you say, well, it's the bad content, you might then respond by saying we have to work at least equally hard against people like this by using our own tools of persuasion to counteract his. So I think the problem only becomes material, not on the basis of a few bad examples, but if you think persuasion is more likely to be associated with bad content, or even to make the content more likely to be bad uh, when the problem's causal in that direction. And that's partly the suggestion here in this paper, I think, uh, that in order to be more persuasive, we're more inclined, we are more inclined to resort to bad behaviors, questionable research practices. And they produce a very long list. I mean, we're all familiar with this kind of thing. Um, and the point is that they characterize all these things as persuasive devices. Uh, it really does go on and on. I'll just pick out um, a couple of those. Um, if we say, take a look at number 16 there, uh, seeking to downplay or hide the limitations of a study. Now, I think that's probably quite a fine line with one of the virtues of persuasion, which is that you make judicious selection of relevant material and you give emphasis where necessary. Or number 17, using words which suggest more than the study delivered. Again, you might flatter yourself in a persuasive context that part of your rhetorical ability, part of your literary, literary flair, is to use language or artful communication which conveys an idea more forcefully on one side than on another. That's what persuasion to some extent is. Now you might still say, well, persuasion is itself like many things, it's neutral, it's not wrong in itself, it's when and how you use it. And if you do tilt into these, the bad end of these things, well, you know, that's not acceptable, of course, but there is a good end. Um, but again, I want to come back to this possibility that maybe there's a systematic tendency in which it's more likely to produce bad science. And um, Richard McElreath, I think, makes that case pretty well here. That an education in science oversells the wins and hides the losses. And this is, I think, the most important bit. It's shit at teaching us how to dis discover, to discover or disdiscover things. So science has a systematic tendency to oversell. And again, maybe this is a bias on my part, but I think we have to think about persuasion in that context. A background of concern about research credibility, about QRPs, perverse incentives, and so on. And how do we judge the risks around these fine lines when there's a lot of overselling about, which may have systemic roots? So this is a case, I think, for thinking about persuading form distinction, messy as it is, simply as a way of sensitizing ourselves to how the bad stuff happens and maybe how to guard against it at a time when we're increasingly aware how much bad stuff there is. So I try to think of this as a, a little schematic here. You know, I think if you're convinced about persuasion, you probably think of it in this sense, that out of good science, there is a natural flow into persuasive communication. And those of us who are worried think that persuasion has a negative effect on good science. Now you can take either of those positions, I think they both have some credibility, I'm much more worried about the black line than I think positively about the blue line. Um, as I say, I'm sure other people will take other views. Um, and I think the black line currently outweighs other considerations. I'm gonna try and articulate one last argument, which is counterintuitive and maybe personal preference, I don't know. And it's this, um, you might actually be more effective if you try to persuade less. Now, why should that be? Well, I think you start by saying, how can you persuade people to do or believe stuff if you think there's a high likelihood you're wrong? That would just be unconscionable, wouldn't it? We, we just wouldn't want to do that. Which is to say that persuasion might be justified by your research confidence. So if you think you're very, very fallible, if you think your stuff's dodgy, I think persuasion is dodgy. But if you're confident you're on solid ground, persuasion might be more than justifiable. It might feel like a duty. The difficulty there, I think, is that you're asking confidence to do an awful lot of work. Um, I think it was Peter Medwar who said, the intensity of the conviction that a hypothesis is true has no bearing on whether it is true or not. Does everyone know 
when they've committed a QRP? Is everyone aware what the incentives to sell might do to their research choices? So what we have here, I think, is an argument that inform rather than persuade is more consistent with research humility based on a strong sense of fallibility. And from there, I think it's a very short step to this, that if you don't show me the reasons why you could be going wrong, by resisting overselling, I find you less credible. And from there, I think it's another short step to this one, <laughs> that if I feel like you're trying to persuade me, I find you less persuasive. I'm sure some of some people will find that unjust, maybe even perverse, I'm not sure. Uh, it's probably a disposition on my part, which I feel because I worry about insert research integrity and all, all of that. But I think if you're not conscious, if you don't signal you're conscious of that, I'll take you with a pinch of salt. Um, last word from my perspective in journalism. When I see people in science saying things like, we must tell good stories. They're so powerful, so persuasive. I think, yes, exactly. That's why you watch them. When you're importing the tricks of the trade from journalism and politics, I think you should see hazard lights because, um, well, believe me, uh, because I've done it, you can do no end of harm telling a good story. And it's the journalistic to tell good stories. I think that causes much of the harm. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, interesting, there was a picture of uh, of Lenin there, who was a terrible public speaker, as it turns out. Um, and Trotsky did all of the public speaking for the, for the Bolsheviks at the time, and who is more remembered now. Um, so at this point, um, I'd like to hand over to Karen Val Jorgensen uh, to give a perspective, and, and then we'll have a short break. Uh, after that. So Karen, over to you. Thanks very much, Neil. Uh, and let me just share my screen. Um, so um, as Neil mentioned in the introduction, uh, I am a, a professor in the Cardiff School of Journalism, Media and Culture. So I'm a journalism scholar, having briefly worked as a journalist. And then I'm also an institutional lead for UKRN on behalf of Cardiff University. Uh, so I'm very interested in debate over reproducibility um, in that in that particular context. But my main kind of disciplinary background is specifically in relation to studying journalistic practices. So that's what I want to talk about uh, today. And the kind of basic argument that I want to make is that distinctions between informing and persuading are built into the very fabric of the institution of journalism, as I think we've already heard from uh, the two previous speakers. It's something that's uh, really foregrounded in journalism training. It's built into core journalistic genres, and it's also essential to claims of journalistic autonomy and independence. That's not to say it's not um, actually a little bit more complicated uh, than that. As we've already heard, it's complicated by the importance of storytelling, but also more recently by things like the rise of partisan news media, as well as the rise of social media. Nonetheless, um, this distinction is still really persists as being very essential, both in terms of how journalists are trained and in terms of how news organizations actually present their content. Um, what I would argue is that this distinction, um, even though it's, um, it's blurry and somewhat problematic in, in certain ways that uh, we've already hinted at, I'm gonna talk about more, at the same time, it's also um, essential in terms of pointing us towards the need to interrogate how we actually present information to audiences. And so what I'm going to argue is that researchers and scholars could benefit from explicit reflection on this distinction between informing and persuading that's so essential in journalism. So. I want to briefly talk about why it is that this distinction between informing and persuading is so essential to journalism. When journalism scholars and historians look at this, what they suggest is that journalism, in a sense, gains its authority and its legitimacy from its status as truth, which comes from this idea that it's a fact-centered discursive practice. It's, it's premised on actually sharing facts. Um, and professional journalism, in turn, um, 
bases its claims on um, the idea of being independent and neutral, both from corporations and also from sources of political power in society. What that means um, in terms of how journalists tend to be trained and tend to do their work is that they um, are trained to really value objectivity or impartiality. So um, the idea is that journalists kind of stand above um, the news and they don't express their own personal opinions, at least not in hard news stories. Um, they do so by relying purely on facts. Um, so that is at least a, a sort of a theory underpinning this. Um, and so um, as the sociologist Gay Tuckman pointed out a long time ago, but in an observation that still I think remains relevant, in a way this idea that journalism is objective serves as a kind of strategic ritual for journalists by claiming to be objective and by claiming just to report the facts in the news stories, they're essentially protecting themselves from risks of the trade. So those are risks, including attacks on their work, um, uh, being uh, told off by your editor, as well as uh, um, very scary things such as libel suits. Um, in the UK context, what we see as particularly influential in relation to these notions around impartiality and neutrality is the notion of impartiality. Um, so um, in, in public service broadcasting, there's an emphasis on ensuring that there's a balanced plurality of voices being heard um, and that journalists as par far as possible when they're presenting the news, keep uh, or refrain from expressing their own personal opinions. Um, similarly, what you can see, if you look at how journalistic genres present themselves, um, news organizations in the ways in which they present their content, um, uh, structure that content through the distinction between informing and persuading or between news and opinion. So if we look at the mastheads of major news organizations, I've here included The Telegraph, The Guardian and The New York Times, what we can see very clearly is that all of them distinguish very clearly between news and opinion. Um, these are organized in very different ways, but there's a very clear separation here between what constitutes fact-based news on the one hand um, and, um, and opinion um, expressed by journalists and other voices on the other. So um, very clearly this distinction between informing through um, through hard news stories on the one hand and persuading through opinion is sort of built into the very fabric of journalism, um, at least in terms of how journalism presents itself. However, this is, as uh, previous presenters have already mentioned, actually a little bit uh, more complicated than it might first appear on the surface. And it's complicated both by longer standing practices as well as by more uh, recent uh, developments. And I think that Alex talked very compellingly based on her own experience about the importance of engaging audiences by telling a good story. Um, certainly when you, uh, when you do uh, uh, in, in, or in the context of documentary production. One of, one of the things that I've um, studied uh, very closely in my career is actually award-winning journalism. Um, and I've been particularly interested in what um, are the kinds of journalism that are perceived to be um, uh, the most highly prized. And so I looked at the Pulitzer Prize winners over a very long period of time, particularly in hard news genres. Um, so I was interested in the Pulitzer Prize because it's the most prestigious journalism award in the country that's most closely associated with the ideal of objectivity. But you do have very similar prizes um, in other media systems around the world. But one of the things that really interested me in my research on um, Pulitzer Prize winning journalism is that actually, um, it's certainly the case that the stories which win the Pulitzer Prizes, they are about the most important and often very complex breaking news stories. But at the same time, um, even as they fit very neatly within this category of informing about 
uh, breaking news of vital importance. They also tend to be stories that pull on heartstrings of audiences, similarly to what, what Alex was talking about. They're persuading audiences to care because of their emotional content, which often comes in the form of telling stories about individuals caught up in very dramatic circumstances. Um, so um, I put up an example here of one of the stories that won the 2023 uh, Pulitzer Prize. This one is in the public service reporting category, which is usually the most kind of hard news category of all the Pulitzer Prize winners. What you can see here is that this is a story about um, the conflict in Ukraine, specifically about Mariupol, and the way in which audiences are drawn into the story is by um, uh, in evoking these very dramatic images um, of young children dying in, in the war. So very much pulling on the heartstrings of audiences. So in that sense, award-winning stories do an exceptional job at informing, but in practice, it may not be actually all that easy to distinguish from persuading. Now, a second kind of complicating factor is uh, the rise of partisan media including um, in the UK case, uh, the very controversial, though not necessarily particularly commercially successful channel, uh, GB News. And what you can see here on the website of GB News is that it distinguishes like news organizations or more mainstream news, news organizations between news and opinion. But we know that that line is very much blurred in terms of their broadcast content. And that's something that's uh, indeed resulted in a very large number of complaints. So what you see is, um, in a sense, that partisan news tends to kind of further blur that boundary between informing and persuading. And then the final um, kind of uh, rapidly developing area that I wanted to touch on in terms of, of kind of creating further complications for this distinction has to do with <clears throat> the rise of social media. Um, so social media are often predicated more on actually expressing news more and persuading rather than solely informing. And there isn't necessarily always a very clear distinction between the two in social media content. And in news just in today from a Press Gazette, the trade uh, magazine for in journalism, what you can see is that TikTok is now one of the most popular news sources in the UK basically on a par with The Guardian and overtaking BBC Radio 1 and Channel 5. So you can see a shift there towards a form of content which is more focused on persuading rather than informing. However, despite all of these practices and trends, journalists continue to be socialized and trained to take very seriously the distinction between informing and persuading, and very much upholding a fact-centered and objective style of journalism. So this morning I did a quick scan of the um, uh, curriculum content for journalism training. And what you can see is that still very much of an emphasis on um, elements, including inverted pyramid style reporting that focuses on getting the most important facts and information out first and training journalists um, to really focus on what in the trade is called the five W's, the who, what, when, where, and why, to really pin down the facts and share that information right from the beginning of the story. So what that shows is that professional journalists are socialized to constantly reflect on the distinction between informing and persuading. But at the same time, what you can also see is that journalism training is to some extent evolving with the changing times. So uh, the National Council for the Training of Journalism, which uh, provides the accredited curriculum for journalism training in the UK, um, <clears throat> now um, trains journalists in multi-platform storytelling as part of its essential journalism module. So you can see to some extent, there's an element of stability that it is premised upon the importance of distinctions between informing and persuading. But on the other hand, there's more of a recognition now, I think, of the importance of storytelling and the kind of complications it brings with it. So just to conclude, what, what I've argued is that this distinction between informing and persuading is actually um, uh, very essential to journalism, but that we are seeing increasingly blurred lines between the two 
And I don't think that line has ever been particularly clear um, in the first place. Nonetheless, what I would suggest um, if we think about scholarly work and what um, researchers can learn from the centrality of the distinction in terms of how journalists are socialized, is that we could really benefit from greater reflexivity around our communication styles, similar to what's been done in journalism, just to enhance the transparency of our scholarly work. Um, and I think that that, that is uh, um, an easy thing to say, but uh, a little bit more difficult to actually do. So in particular, I think we need to pay attention to the fact that scholarly writing is a very uh, broad church. But there are significant disciplinary differences um, as well as a diversity of individual styles. Um, also, um, I think that some disciplines have come very far in terms of such reflections and others have a very long, long, long way to go. But either way, what I think is important to note and what this, um, this, this workshop, uh, I think, makes, makes quite clear is that scholarly writing does have its own epistemologies. And as a community, um, we could really benefit from interrogating these epistemologies. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Karen. And, and I, I do wonder whether some of the words you used in, in that presentation around objectivity, balance, impartiality, you know, and the distinctions between those things might be useful phrases for us to come back to perhaps in the Q&A. So we'll move on now to uh, to hear from uh, Bambo and from Nikki, some reflections from each, and uh, then we'll have a short break and go to a panel session. So please don't uh, don't forget to be thinking of some really good questions to help with that panel session as we go through. But in the meantime, Bambo, uh, your thoughts and reflections. Great, thank you. And this is very much um, thoughts and reflections. So what you're gonna be doing today is hearing me think out loud around um, the theme of story skills and narrative and what narrative can lend us to the idea of this distinction between informing or persuading. Um, and I think perhaps to be more precise, what I'm really looking at is what can narrative theory and experience from narrative practice lend to this discussion. Um, I think it's probably really important to say as well that I'm, I think I'm coming from a very different perspective from the other um, speakers. So I'm a creative practitioner. A lot of the work that I do and the work that I support is actually um, within the fictional or poetic domain. So there isn't initially that imperative um, to present facts in that um, clear cut way um, that um, people working within a more science um, domain um use but at the same time there is a sense of rigor and, st and standards and also a real kind of nuanced understanding of what narrative really is as a form and a mode of communication and i think perhaps that's where i can lend something a little bit different um, to to the discussion so one thing i'd like just to ask people to do and i'll come back to it later is if you could put in the chat, just um, please just say um, just in very briefly the background that you come from. So are you a researcher, academic and what what tradition or discipline are you working in? And I'll, I'll come back to that later in my pre presentation. And, and then I'll also just say it's about say, saying a little bit more about my um, theoretical and disciplinary position that I'm coming from both within this conversation and in the work um, that I've done um, around the theme of narrative within my career as a creative practitioner and, and researcher. As Neil mentioned before, I'm just at the start of a three year project which is looking at story skills and how story skills are used across a range of contexts. Um, and it's, it's very much in its early stages. So a lot of the ideas that I'm going to be presenting here um, are provisional. Um, but I'm also building on a career, um, both as a theorist and as a practitioner. So story and narrative production has always been central to my work um, in both of these areas. As an artist, I've written plays, made films and curated digital art projects. And as a theorist, I've attempted to analyze and understand the role that narrative takes within communities, cultures and societies. So my PhD, for example, looked at how stories can help cultural producers and audiences to engage in futures such as climate change in realities that are there and in process but aren't always visible to the naked eye. 
And since then, um, my work has focused on building and facilitating narrative communities to, to work and explore ideas around different social themes um, and challenges. So as much as I'm a practitioner, I'm also a theorist and I'm interested in what I call the deep structures of story. And again, I'll return to that later. So coming from this perspective of both a, a maker and a theorist of story, I would suggest that there are two ways in which we can think about narrative within the context of this theme of inf informing versus persuading. Firstly, you can think of narrative as something that's contained within a text. Um, so let's call, we'll call this approach the textual approach to narrative analysis. And secondly, you can think of narrative as an active component within a wider set of social, cultural, logical, cultural even e ecological relationships. And I'm going to call this the performative or the phenomenological view of narrative. So within the textual view of narrative, everything that you need to know about the narrative is contained within the body of me the medium. So we could take, for example, um, an academic journal as the medium. And if you wanted to understand and analyze how the distinction between persuading and informing is working within the, within the article from a textual point of view, you just need to analyze the structure and the content of the writing and the language that has been used. And there's already been some discussion about this. So for example, if the article is persuasive writing, then the structure and content will reveal this. It might begin with a hook or a positioning statement and then move on to a series of arguments using a style or rhetoric that explicitly aims to prove the argument. And finally, it will conclude or bring that argument home, um, back, relating back to the initial position that's been made. Informative writing also uses rhetoric. It has and structure. It's got a beginning, middle and end. However, rather than opening with a positioning statement, it will start with a context background to the essay perhaps describing the reasoning for the study or the methodologies that have been used. It will then move on to lay out the facts and the evidence. And finally, it will conclude the discussion, um, perhaps bringing in some more subjective insights, um, but looking, referring back to the evidence and talking about what we might learn from the insights that have, have been gained. So both have a structure, both use rhetorics, um, but they're, they're, they're done in different ways. So what I want to do now is to move on from the textual point of view and how look, look at how we might analyze and explore this distinction between informing and persuading from a performative perspective or a phenomenological perspective. So the performative or phenomenological view takes into account um, the structure of the narrative, but also considers the wider context within which the narrative sits. So for, for example, from a contextual point of view, we might start to ask questions about the author, who, who, who am I? Um, and what is the institutionally and disciplinary context within which, which we sit? And we've all said a little bit about, about that today. Um, so the fact that I'm a creative practitioner is relevant to my positioning in this discussion. Um, and we also might ask questions or think about the reader. So I imagined when I was writing this, I'm speaking to, to scientists, um, um, but just looking in the chat, it does seem as if, yeah, we've got a large predominance of, of people coming from a science background rather than a creative background. And knowing that informs um, what I'm saying today um, and how I'm presenting this argument. And finally, we're also looking at the relationship between the text, the author and the audience. It's looking at how these these are evolving. So although we tend to think of text as a, as a fixed thing, in reality, even if you have a fixed text, that relationship is always evolving as new audiences come to and, and reinterpret that text. Um, so from a performative perspective, um, the meaning or the message produced in any research article is not limited to the text itself, but rather the pro it's a product of the relationship between the author, the text and the audience. So the question is, is which of these approaches, the textual approach or the sort of more performative phenomenological one is going to help us in this, this discussion? Um, and I would suggest that neither is fully adequate, um, but perhaps we need to revise our understanding of the relationship between text, content, um, context and narrative. And we also need to really expand our understanding of the deeper structures and um, purposes of story. Um, and this is where I'm really going on to, 
speculative thinking here. So with the work that I've been doing on story skills, I've been really asking and wondering whether our current theories about the structure of narrative are adequate to understand the kind of complexities in these kinds of debates. So obviously there's been a lot of work done in, in many kind of fields and domains, but typically people still tend to say every story has a beginning, a middle and, a, and, and an end. Um, and whilst that is useful, what it doesn't really tell us is about the value and the purposes of story. So the theory that I'm developing, um, it still has the idea of beginning, middle and end, but the basic idea is to look at it in a much more interactive, kind of from an interactive ecosystem perspective. So what I usually say is that every story begins with a need, is mediated by experience, and then results in a change. Um, the need itself is a relational property within a context or an ecosystem. Um, the experience can be an experience that is lived, is real, but it also can be an experience that's observed as well. And the change can be a change in perception, or it can be an actual real observable measurable change. So this view of story can help us understand both how a narrative structures, even within a fictional context in a film, because you can look at the, the change of, of the character arc. You can look at it to look at how a documentary film works, but you can also look at narrative as something that is a live component of our interactions with each other. So today we're coming to this event with all with our own narrative stories and we, we're all coming at this question from, from different perspectives. And that to me is, is has an element of, of narrative structure, structure to it. So applying that approach back to looking at how that helps us with um, the difference between informing and persuading. So if we kind of look at an informative context, um, the desire or the need, I would say information, the need to be presented with facts is a need. It, it's about our safety, it's about us making informed decisions so that there's a need there. And that need is then played out within different um, real kind of circumstances and situations. So that might be a live evolving situations. So a, a really easy example to use is always the COVID, the, the, the pandemic. There was a real need there to be understanding what was happening from a fact factual perspective. But you can also then narrow that down, that the, the circumstance might be narrowed down within a laboratory or within a scientific experiment as well. So that that can be the situation in which the need is played out. And then there's a change and that change, if you're looking from an informative point of view, needs to be objectivably verifiable. You need to be able to measure that. Within a more persuasive context, you also have the, the pattern, but the need then is, is different. And for me, I was really glad to see people talking about spectrums, but there, there, there are many reasons why we might persuade. But I, I suppose the starting point, the real difference is that you're not, the need isn't to inform, but perhaps to produce a change of one kind or another. And there may be good or bad reasons why you need to produce that change. The experience then is how that change actually then comes about. And again, you might talk about that from a subjective point of view, or you could do more scientific research in terms of, is there a change occurring? How is that change actually occurring? Um, and then finally, the, the change at the end of it is, is more likely to be a change in some way in, in perception. So the same pattern is there, but really the, the key thing is, is actually looking at context in all of this. And I think other people talked about that. For me, you can't really have um, a debate about the, the value of informing, persuading without really understanding the context. And I think that's where the value judgments are made as to whether it's right to inform or, or persuade. Um, so I'll probably leave it there, but I think just the, the last thing I would say as well is just, throwing out a challenge from a, a creative point of view is I've noticed um, in a lot of the presentations that we had today, there was sort of a sense in which when you're informing, you're working within a kind of a really rational, uh, logical mode. And when you're persuading, um, you're bringing in an element of emotion in there and that perhaps bringing emotion into these conversations or uh, these uh, is a bad thing, whereas the logical approach is, is good. 
Um, and I, I'd question that from a creative point of view and also from a question of which is the most valuable. So often um, as artists, we do want to make people feel things. We want to open up. We don't want to tell them what to feel, but we want to open up the space for feeling. And actually some forms of communication try to close down that space for feeling and to stop, stop you from, from feeling. Um, and even if we kind of take something like the pandemic as an, as an example, it was the facts. It was the facts of the pandemic that scared us. So um, I don't think it's necessarily the truth that on the one hand you have informative and that's rational and objective. And on the other hand, you have persuasion and that's always about emotion. Um, so I'm just, that's just a thought that, that I have. Um, but I just, I just thought as a creative, I just wanted to slightly trouble the idea that kind of the simplicity of the division between the two forms of rhetoric. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Bambo. And, and certainly if we're thinking about positionality, which is one of the things that you were talking about there, that can be quite an emotional thing to, for, for anyone to talk about, including a researcher. So uh, I absolutely take your point there. Thanks very much for your, your reflections there. We'll come back to that. But um, Nikki, uh, can you talk to us a little bit from uh, the perspective of a, a journal and a publisher? Yeah, absolutely. So let me just put this. OK. Uh, that green thing okay yeah so um well thanks a lot for inviting me to take part in this first of all and to the other speakers this has been really already really interesting um and i'm looking forward to the discussion so i hope i'm not gonna i'm gonna do my best to stay on track here because i think that's going to be where this gets really great um so yeah i'm uh i'm some i'm the chief editor for nature energy uh, which is part of the nature um, portfolio of journals. I'm a physicist by training, um, but I uh, left my academic position, such as it was uh, in 2011, uh, to, to, to get into the world of publishing and editorial. And I've been now running Nature Energy for eight years. And um, uh, so, so yeah, so my, my background really is much more technical, but since joining this journal, and I'll say a little bit more about it later, that span has really extended much more across disciplines, and, and, and I want to talk a little bit about that within this context, because I think it's an interesting transition that is that is having an influence on a lot of this uh, debate and, and, and where we're putting the emphasis on these things, um, but I'll get into that a little bit more uh, later. Um, and then I guess just to say that I'm so I'm coming from that like a very sort of largely um, material science view these days, but also a, a social science perspective or an economic perspective, looking at energy, environment, climate issues. So that will inform a lot of what I say, um, as much as I will try to make this somewhat general to trends that we see within uh nature journals but that that's always going to be underpinning what what i'm seeing and then talking about so i wanted to make that clear now um so i i think it's probably good to just give a bit of background first of all get a bit more background i guess on on the nature journals here for those who don't know so nature is a is a weekly publication um that aims to publish across the sciences on on uh, what it sees as the most significant advances and it has a strong news section and strong um, opinion section that is designed to do a lot of work in contextualizing and translating scientific findings or trends or, or, or other events to a wider um, and frequently non-scientific public um, and that journal is uh, uh, just over 150 years old now. Um, but we also now have uh, the what we call the nature research journals. So these are more um, targeted versions of nature. So taking the nature model, but applying these to more specific disciplines or subjects. And so narrowing that lens a bit, but trying to do similar things. And so now providing deeper 
uh, insights or elevating research that's happening that might not be of, of very broad public interest, um, but still trying to also provide a lot of that contextualization, translation, uh, and, and analysis. And then we also have uh, another journal, Nature Communications, that kind of narrows that lens a little bit even more, um, while still trying to provide a lot of these functions. Um, and so the, the, the ways that these journals have operated have grown largely out of very traditional scientific uh, communication processes and disciplinary thinking and leanings. Um, and so the early, for example, the early nature research journals titles were things around material science, genetics, immunology, um, uh, very, you know, that very traditional uh, way of, of thinking about science. But in more recent years, we have, um, as, a, as a publishing group, been seeking to respond more to what is changing in the uh, academic space, but also in the societal space around a lot of the grand challenges, um, you know, as exemplified through things like the SDGs or through our understanding of the climate crisis or thinking about food security and food crises and so on and so forth, which means that we are starting to try to launch journals, Nature Energy being one of them, that are now looking more in a more uh, holistic way across multiple disciplines, trying to draw out more of these cross-cutting challenges and themes and ideas that are frequently more policy facing and where there is um, more there, you know, there is a strong sense of urgency amongst different communities for action, for change, and where, where people are facing complex crises and trying to think about the presentation and, and dissemination of scientific evidence against these kinds of competing political, economic uh, tensions and, and positions, and how we do that and who we communicate to and how that changes the audience. And so this is, this is uh, something that I think we're seeing a lot more often. I think the COVID crisis accelerated a lot of thinking, certainly uh, within nature journals about how that also plays out in public health settings and how lots of um, challenges around equity, um, social justice are also intertwined in this. And I think that then has had an increasingly strong influence on how we view the, these roles for informing and persuading, particularly as um, actors within this, these spaces, uh, the different types of researcher are trying to have impact and influence with what they do um, on things that they are understandably very passionate about. And so what role do we then play in that as, as journals? Okay, so to provide a bit more of a picture though of perhaps how we're thinking about this, this is a, an example of the kind of anatomy of how our, our journals may look. We have a range of offerings of different article types. The journals are, are quite magazine-like in a way. We don't only focus on publishing research because we're also trying to provide this contextualization, this translational role. So we, we have a series of different article types that allow authors, and these are mostly researchers, but not exclusively researchers, different spaces to um, play out these kinds of informing and persuading positions. And I'll, I'll, I'll return to that in a minute. I think the thing I'd like to talk about a little bit first is, is this idea of research articles and some of the, the things that we are looking at around research articles. Um, although mostly what I kind of want to come back to is, is these other types of outlet um, where we can do more to differentiate the notions of informing versus persuading, I think. So on research articles, and perhaps in, in part, this is in reflecting on some of what people said earlier, and we can, expand on in the, um, in the Q and A at the end. But I think what we have seen, certainly what I have noticed in my career in editorial for just over a decade now, um, has been increasing focus and emphasis on thinking about and responding to reproducibility crises 
and the need to provide greater robustness in terms of transparency of um, early on, I would say much more around methodological transparency. There was a more emphasis on us as, as editors and publishers to boost the transparency of methods and how experiments were carried out and conducted. And that's extending a lot more recently into thinking about reporting standards and differentiating these across disciplines and trying to boost all of these different um, types of transparency within the reporting of research findings so as to really emphasize and underpin this and these this the informing aspect of a lot of this work and making sure that people who are reading and using this work can ably reproduce it but i would also argue that it's a way of also allowing re um, uh, readers and this was touched on a little bit earlier as well um, to also be able to make their own mind up about conclusions reached in research papers. Um, the more information we can provide, and this also includes lots of things around limitations, um, I think the more we can let researchers and other, other types of, um, of expert challenge conclusions drawn by uh, the authors, which is perhaps where more of the persuading starts to creep into papers, as has also been discussed. Um, and I think there's a very strong role for editors there in thinking very carefully about these reporting standards, but also thinking about issues of, of overselling, as we've heard, um, and also ensuring that they feel as though it is possible for a reader to be able to draw their own conclusions and not be too swayed um, by overly persuasive elements um, in, in conclusion or discussion sections. Um, yeah, so that's what I want to say about that. Then I, then I kind of wanted to touch, come back to this idea of, of these other types of article that we offer um, on nature journals, and you see this in, in, in other publishers as well, um, where, we, where we are really building out much more of a spectrum of options for, for Again, mostly academics, but also frequently these days, more including more types of, of expert from practitioners to people in private sector, in industry, and in, in decision making bodies, NGOs, INGOs, governments to, to get their message across. Because with what we hope to accomplish through, a, through the journals is. is um, an exchange of views, an exchange of ideas um, to help further what is happening, to help further the debate and discussion. But what we also want to do is make sure that the, there are, there are uh, media vehicles for that to happen in a way that it becomes, it's, it's clearer whether or not we are more in one of these two modes. So at one end of this spectrum, we use article types that are far more in a persuasive mode where there is less emphasis on evidence presentation, perhaps more reliance on, on citation of literature, but the construction of, 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 of argument without presenting new data um, or, or pulling data out of um, existing literature to make arguments. And that's more what's happening over here on the, on the, on the left side of the screen. And then at the other end, we have things that are that are more in an informative mode, that are more designed to present um, in a more neutral way things that are happening um, and, and narratives and discourses and, and um, thinking about new findings and new research. Um, and that's more where I think where, where say our review articles would sit, which are typically narrative review articles. Um, but we find, um, and again, echoing points from earlier, it's never the case that what any of these modes is purely one or the other. So even in our review articles, which are designed to be providing an overview of recent uh, findings on a topic in the literature, there is a strong expectation that there will be elements of opinion in there. And we find even in peer review, if there is not enough of an opinion, reviewers are critical because they want to understand what is the view of the person who has now drawn this out? And so I 
that, that, that has to then come with an understanding that what we are seeing here is not purely uh, pure summary, but is, is still seen through the particular lens of whoever has written that, that article. So it becomes very difficult. And I think one of the jobs that we, that we have as editors that, can become, that becomes increasingly complex is thinking about how within these different options we have, where does what the, the author is trying to do fit and understand what they're attempting to do, what do they want to say and to whom, and how do we navigate these different outlets in a way that helps the reader understand well, I'm at more, this, is, this piece is intentionally more persuasive or, or potentially intentionally more informative. And then how do we build the appropriate uh, uh, narrative around that and what is needed? And so what I'll do is quickly just provide and, and talk through a little bit around some of the, the challenges that I think we're, we are tackling within, uh, within publishing to support a lot of these, these uh, trends and, and needs. Um, so the, the foremost of these, again, as I said earlier, is, is around transparency and the idea of reporting standards. Um, this involves a lot of community engagement and feedback and listening and then trying to support those needs in a way that best serves each discipline, but, but best serves ultimately readers of the work. And, and, and there's a lot of thought that we have to do that is about thinking through Again, some of these ideas that came up around issues of overselling, issues of overly persuading within research papers and trying to keep um, them to be as fact-based as, as possible whilst recognizing a need to, to provide some degree of context and an outlook for the work. Um, one of the other challenges we have perhaps more in these magazine style pieces is the balance of evidence and assertion that can often come up. We have constraints around word counts. We have constraints around uh, presentation options, and particularly in our commentary or opinion sections, how do we as editors help the authors or, or, or make the authors often strike a balance between these, these two kinds of positions so that, again, readers can feel like they are comfortable with what's being presented, that they find it credible, um, but that well, they still recognize this as, as being opinion. We have lots of challenges around peer review and the role of peer review in lots of these things. Some of our articles are peer reviewed, some of them aren't. We're increasingly moving to a world of, of um, making it clear when peer review has taken place and trying to, to uh, and you, because we recognize the role that plays it again in ideas of credibility um, of content. We think very carefully and, and have to be increasingly careful around the intended audience. Not all of our communications are scientist to scientist. People are trying to persuade others. So we have to, we think a lot and try to help sculpt things so that those audiences are, are acknowledged. And then the way that the arguments are constructed is mindful of that um, in, in as clear and open a way as we can make it so that we feel, and this connects to my last point, that the readers and users of these pieces can trust um, in, in what they are reading. And I think this has become increasingly important um, since, since the COVID crisis, um, amongst other, other um, general mistrust in experts uh, concerns. But, but this in a way underpins, well, is, is really what then underpins or drives the, the, all these preceding points. We want to make sure that what we are publishing is trustworthy or that our readers trust us. And so this, plays out through these various roles and I think is more and more important. Um, and I'll stop there um, so that we, we have the, we can go on into the break and then the discussion, but that's, that's kind of a real overview of some of what we're trying to tackle here on uh, within the journals. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that insight, Nikki. That's been really helpful. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I have recently been sort of thinking about this in terms of it being a, a wicked problem. A wicked problem is one that's characterized by lots of complexity, lack of resolution, interdependency and interests. And of course, there's all sorts of constituencies with interests in, in the thought, sorts of things we're talking about now. My suspicion is that I've got a very easy job here um, because I suspect that you will have some 
great questions to ask. Uh, if you do, please put your hand up in Zoom in the traditional, the now traditional way, or uh, post them in the chat. So uh, I'm looking for, I've seen Alex has put a couple of questions in the chat already. I'm going to give uh, our audience a, a minute or two just to give them a chance uh, before coming to your questions, Alex, if that's all right. So, Timo, you are quickest. Do you want to go and, uh, and ask your question? Yeah, thank you so much for putting this together. It's really interesting. And thank you to all the speakers um, to sh you know share their perspective on clearly very complex issue. So I've been thinking about that for quite a while, actually, in peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, scientific communication. Um, and I feel sometimes that, um, you know, being maximally transparent and rigorous in your communication actually leads to bad communication. I give you an example from data visualization that I keep talking about bar graphs, right? Bar graphs have a very different, um, very difficult, bad reputation nowadays because they have been argued to hide distributions. Um, so they're not transparent and, you know, they're used to kind of um, manipulate the audience. So people have advocated for something more complex, showing complex patterns of distributions. But these kinds of visualizations, they also require a certain level of a statistical understanding so they're less accessible and they're also complex so in many communication situations where we don't have much time to comprehend them they're probably not very well targeted to the audience in that context and they might not have the time to comprehend them fully understand them and remember the message you want to convey so there's really like this these two forces right we want to be rigorous and transparent on the one hand but we also want to communicate well we want to get our point across we want to get feedback we want to talk to people about things right and that kind of stands in its each each other's way so i was wondering you know how that can be resolved um and i haven't really found a solution to that yet that's a great question. Thank you, Tima. Um, who'd like to pick that one up from the panel? Michael. I'll, um, I think it is a very good question. I'll have a go. Um, uh, one of the things we advocate through Winton is um, layering of information. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the technique. Um, uh, you can present your bar charts, um, but there's not exactly a shortage of space on the internet. You know, you, depending on where you're publishing, there's usually a way of then taking those audiences who want the further information a little bit further, and you can provide the connections or the links or, you know, just further down in the piece and so on. Um, I mean, I was recently involved in a, um, a piece of work trying to assess the impartiality of the BBC's coverage of economics. And quite a lot of the pushback we got was we can't tell people the nuance. It's too complicated. We'll lose them. And by and large, what this resulted in was a simple distortion. And you, you do to have some extent, I think, have a choice, you know, which evil. But I don't think it's an absolute choice. I think there are things we can do, as I say, you know, just to try and let people in further where they want to go. Thanks, Michael. Karen, you wanted to come in on this too. Yeah, I mean, um, just just a sort of slightly broader point in a way. I think it it raises really important questions. Um, uh, on the one hand, around uh, this tension between journalists wanting to report an engaging and accessible story, and on the other hand, scientists wanting to communicate the complexities of their results. So, having served in this capacity of both um, both being a the scientist and being the journalist before. Um, I've come across this uh, from kind of both sides of the table. And I think that we have to recognize that there are competing logics there, but we also have to recognize that when scientists and scholars seek to communicate with audiences, then they do face this challenge of, you know, also wanting to present um, their findings in an engaging and accessible way. Um, and I think um, Nikki touched on um, on, so, on some of those complexities as well in, in this way, um, you know, uh, in terms of a compelling work uh, that he's doing. Um, so I think that there, there's a real issue there um, in relation to how we communicate science. And particularly, I think also, again, around uh, you know, uh, making our results seem more spectacular than they are, perhaps oversimplifying um, scientific communication. Um, 
And um, I think this is, is kind of an ongoing battle, uh, both for journalists um, and for scientists as well. Um, and I think that questions around data visualization are one part of this, but it's for me, it's a much larger question about sort of clashing logics and about how to stay true to um, the actual sort of rigor and integrity of scientific research while at the same time communicating your findings in an accessible manner so that audiences are able to engage with it. Thanks, Karen. Um, and if you've got views or answers to any of the questions that have been put in the chat, please, please put them, uh, put your responses there. Uh, that's not limited to panelists. We can all answer the questions and we'll all have views. So please do contribute in the chat as well. But Alex, you wanted to come in on this question too. Yes, just briefly. Um, I mean, I think uh, it is a complicated question, but I think um, it depends what information you want to get across depends on whether you are trying to get across information to tell a message that you have decided on, or whether you want to get across information that the audience might find relevant to making up their own mind about the matter that you are communicating about. And so things like, um, you know, showing the full distribution, you have as a communicator, if you're not trying to communicate an opinion and a set message and you want the audience to understand it more deeply, I think you have to think about whether the distribution is relevant in that context. And of course, that means that we're always as communicators making decisions about what we think is relevant, but it's whether you come to that decision about what's relevant from the perspective of what's relevant only if I want to get my message across or what's relevant if I want to communicate so that the audience have all the information they need to make up their mind on the particular matter that I am communicating here. So that's not necessarily all the information in the world, but it's being slightly more open-minded about what information might be necessary. And of course, if you can do audience research to find out what's relevant, which in some cases you can, then that's, that's even better. But sometimes you have to second guess it. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Timo, for a great question. Uh, Vivek, I think you might be next. Uh, it's a question rather than response. Uh, yeah. Um, so this is a question, that I, I guess, more to frame it in this broad sense is about structural incentives and how that shifts it from one to the other. And if you want to stick it uh, to um, more informative rather than persuasive, how do we set that up? But specifically, I guess, the, it, with an example, it would be a question maybe predominantly for Nikki is especially in journals like Nature or uh, other really high impact uh, journals, the whole focus is on novelty, on impact, and there's a huge gatekeeping by editors of submissions. That's inevitably going to lead people to try to persuade, if nobody else, the editor uh, and the reviewers. So that's, that's already making a huge shift from information to persuasion, show your data in a particular way, really set it up. How do we combat that? So we'll go to Nikki on that great question, but I'm sure the other panelists will have views on that. Nikki. <laughs> yeah, nice, easy one. I mean, look, it's a really, it's a really important question. It's a very common question. You're right that I mean, the number of papers that I read in any given week that are very clearly distorting what they've done using hyperbolic language. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very alarming, right? And what what I what can sometimes frustrate is that I I would hope that the things that come out at the end of our process don't look hyperbolic and distorted, right? We work really hard to try to make sure they're balanced. You know, we got peer review is, is incredibly rigorous. Um, we have all sorts of reporting processes. And yet there is this kind of real thing where people think, well, I, what I really need to do here is hype this thing up just present this thing, distort these axes. Um, but there's, there, there's, I still feel like they're in the minority, but, but in the end, yeah, there are, there are, there are often people who, who yeah, the incentives matter, right? Yeah, they're really, they're really important. I don't know how we, one thing I've often wondered a lot about is is the maybe and maybe preprints to an extent help with this. Like the distinction between what comes in and what comes out can often reveal a lot about how we've worked hard to adjust language framing. Um, and it's maybe maybe I shouldn't be saying things like this, but either. But you know, like the 
there's there there is still this challenge of the extent to which in terms of uh grant applications tenure um job positions journals are i'm very on i know i'm on very dodgy ground as a nature editor now right but like that that is used as a shorthand and i think we all as as uh, within this ecosystem on in, in both or in all sides have a role to play in trying to shift away from that reliance on these things as a shorthand which would de-emphasize but yeah the, there is there is intense competition um it's easy again for me to say but i do think that more often than not really good work still gets found read cited and applauded um wherever it appears and i think what we try to do more now is is find those good homes and champion those homes for for, for work that we don't think meets our bar and i think the other thing that we try to do a lot more now is think differently about what are those selection criteria so more and more de-emphasizing um those real the, the things that, as, as you framed in your question so moving away from this being totally novel totally unique lots of things that are actually not really true anyway like none of these things are come out of nowhere they're all incremental in different ways so thinking very carefully as editors about why does this matter and focusing on that and focusing on the evidence and focusing on the quality of work and thinking about those as part of our rubric for making decisions more than you know oh this is the most jazzy glittering exciting thing i've seen in a long time and it but it's a slow process and it's about training us and us being more reflexive as, as editors and and uh, and I think about shifting some of those where how, where those incentives are coming from. Thanks, Nikki, uh, very much for that. Bam Bambo, I think you wanted to come in as well. Um, yes, I wanted to answer the question about structural incentives at the same time as um, answering Alex's question. Um, I'm wondering if people have missed Alex's question in the comments. Alex, could you um, sort of re um, could you just explain your question? <laughs> Um, about negative findings? Yeah, just very briefly then. So I was interested um, that Bambo was talking about change as being integral to the structure of a story. And it made me think that perhaps, you know, it's infamously difficult to publish replications or negative findings. And I wonder if that is because that means that they're not telling an exciting story. And that is why, and that journals essentially are looking for good stories and that that is a structural issue. Yeah, no, thank you. So I'm glad you put that in uh, during the break because it gave me a bit of time to think about it. I, I would agree that as a society, we, we're, we're attracted to stories that have change and the bigger the change, the more dramatic the story. I don't actually think that this is necessarily quite to do with that because actually even with negative change, there is still a change. So if you're looking at it from a narrative perspective, and even just from a, looking at the kind of films and stories we consume, I think the issue is that we like happy endings, positive endings, so that, that's one of them. So it's, um, we feel more satisfied when the story is in the direction of somebody creating a positive change as to actually looking, oh no, this is, this is not what I expected. This is, I've discovered that I was wrong. We're less interested in those kind of negative, negative stories. I, 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 that's my, the first part to the, to the answer. The second part is actually about, again, it's another trend and it's, this is specific to this era it's that we've become captured by this idea of the single hero narrative, where there's a single person who discovers and brings about or makes that, that change. Um, and this is where I think that actually art and science have more in common than you would think. So I heard once a long time ago, somebody say of science, but I've always felt it's the same as art, that science is built on failures so you you get the scientists who win the nobel prizes but that only happens because lots of other people have gone down dead ends made mistakes realized that what they thought was true something that was true wasn't true so that the science is built on a scientific community not an individual but it is the individuals who then make that big discovery that get get the reward 
Um, and it's the same with artists as well. You, you, art, an artist needs to be brave and to make failures and to produce work that other people doesn't like. And it's only through everybody being willing to do that that you get the people that are celebrated as, as the great authors. So I think in terms of that question about change, it, again, it's that, it's that issue that we want to be, or we're kind of both through um, actual incentives, financial incentives, rewards in work, we're encouraged to be that single author hero, rather than seeing our failure as, as part of a bigger narrative that's taking place in which as a community, we are producing the change and understanding the changes we need, need even though as individuals, we might not be. So um, I, I'm very much in favour of encouraging more kind of multi-author or, or multi-hero concepts of, of narrative. Thank you, Bambo. That's that's fascinating. Nikki, I think you wanted to come back on this as well. Yeah, I just thought maybe it's useful. I'll uh, just try and add a couple of quick reflections on it. Um, I think the point about there being a structural challenge to some like negative negative results i mean certainly journals broadly are just they by design publish new things and generally positive things and yeah that that is a there's a problem in there um and there it leaves space for journals to tr that can can move in there um or for the rest of us to think about how these things work replication studies is in, that are interesting um so colleagues of mine on on one of the journals here so on human behavior have started to try to publish more replication studies of past findings. And there are challenges associated with that, but there is a willingness to, 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 to do it. But I think a lot of it gets caught up in, you know, lots of, uh, lots of sometimes interpersonal issues or, or, or like, you know, the narratives and, and issues of concerns around blame and so on, so it's tricky. One one thing that I'll add in, in a slightly different vein, I mean, we are seeing a, a growing um, trend towards supporting um, registered reports as an approach. Um, and so more of our journals are adopting this as a format. So this, for, for, for people unfamiliar, is where you, you design the study in advance, it is peer reviewed, the journal makes a decision about whether or not they're going to publish it on the basis of the design plan and the strength of the question. And then they commit to publishing it, whatever the outcomes of the results are, as long as it is you know, still considered sound and the, the data hold up and so forth. So they are trying to remove some of those biases about how the decision gets made. And this is proving very popular. Um, and then extended to that though, I, I would say like from my perspective, I mean, we frequently have decision discussions about which papers to send for review, where we often find ourselves saying, well, like actually the result of this doesn't matter. Like the size of this effect in this intervention isn't that important to us. It's the fact that they asked the question because this is an important question to have some evidence around and that's what motivates us. So that's maybe not quite in a null result space, but sometimes it can be, and that's kind of interesting. And the last thing I'll just say on Bambo's point, I think that coming from where I work, now looking at particularly clean technology and that innovation space, understanding what went wrong and what failed is really critically important, looking at like clean energy transition and climate change. And we do need to think about ways to capture more of failure um, in order to avoid just repeating failures because we didn't talk about them. And that for me is both results, but also why, how people worked and why they did things and made choices so that we as a community can do better in terms of innovation. So uh, that, I'll stop there. Thank, thanks, Nikki. Uh, and even the word failure is problematic in some ways, isn't it? Um, so, but Bamba, your hand's still up. Is that a legacy hand? It's, yes, it is. I will lower that hand. Although I am very interested in uh, Teresa's uh, question, but I'll let somebody else have a go at that first. Uh, okay. Um, can we keep Teresa's question just for a moment, because I'm aware that Leon asked a question some time ago, um, and we ought to come to Leon. Leon, do, do you want to ask your question, or do you want me to read it out? Whatever's easiest. It was to do with any studies that have been done comparing uh, uh, different treatments, informational, persuasive, of the same topic, 
to a similar audience demographic or the same audience demographic and comparing the audience responses? Alex. Yes, we've done it. Um, so we took um, some persuasive government communications on uh, two topics on COVID and nuclear power in the UK. And we made an informative only version where it was balanced the pros and cons, it had the uncertainties in, it had quality of evidence, had all of the things that we would think of as making it informative rather than persuasive. And then we gave people either one or the other in a randomized control um, study in UK representative population. And we found that it was quite interesting because luckily we gathered people's prior opinions on the topic. And what we found is that people who were pro the topic and were given either the persuasive or the informative version, they it didn't make any difference to them. It, concorded with their beliefs and so they trusted the information they said it was equally trustworthy it was high trustworthiness but people who were anti-nuclear or anti-vax um, they trusted much more the informative version than the persuasive version um, which isn't hugely surprising as Michael was saying if you feel that somebody's trying to persuade you against your opinion and you sense that in the writing, then you're probably going to react against it and think, oh, I, you know, I trust that less than if somebody is more open minded and even handed in their communication. Um, but yes, I can I can put the reference in the channel. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. OK, let's come to Teresa's question, which uh, is a large question in lots of ways. Um, I don't know which of the panel might want to pick this up. Bamba, you were expressing interest in this. Yes, I was, I was hoping someone would go first because I'm nervous about the question because I think it's I think you have to be careful about uh, I do believe that there is such thing as as, as truth and um, trust. So I think it's important not to throw out the baby with the bath water. I, for me, I think it comes back to context. It's understanding that a particular truth is only true within a in a context. Um, and I think that's why the work on reproducibility, the theme of reproducibility is important because it's about understanding what particular facts um, hold true within what particular context. And I think that also links with my understanding about narrative as well, which is that it, it always is played out within a context regardless of, of the position that, you, that you're taking. So I think that's the best I can do with that one for now. Thank you, Bambo. Karen. I mean, I, I would agree with uh, with Bembo's uh, sort of assessment of this, um, and I think I would just add that uh, there are some difficulties for journalism in terms of reflecting the complexities of changes in in well our knowledge of truths in scientific disciplines. So I think that um, if we think particularly of the journalistic convention of having to uh, have a balance of different viewpoints that has done a lot of harm in terms of reporting of science, um, anything ranging from um, uh, climate change to the safety of vaccines, for example. So I think this, this idea that journalists uh, tend to have that they need to have at least one voice on either side can lead to misleading conceptions, uh, particularly in situations where approximately 99.9% .9 of scientists believe one thing and, um, and there's only a very small minority of scientists believing something else. So I think that we can um, um, acknowledge that there is such a thing as truth, um, even though um, understandings um, of that may, may actually change over time, but that there are complexities to that in terms of actually reporting on it for journalists. And so um, it's it's a it's a really kind of challenging uh, set of questions, I think, and really interesting debate to bring up as well. Yeah, thank you very much for raising that, Teresa. Um, let's go back, Alex, you raised a question earlier on for actually for, for Karen and Nikki. Um, and I don't know whether we've picked this up already or whether you want to ask it now. No, I don't think we have. I, I'm interested um, because both of you talked about how 
in journals and in news outlets. Opinion is, you know, literally separated on the menu from news or research articles. And I wondered if the, you knew of any evidence of how much the audience picked up on that separation. Um, and, and yeah, how they perceived that really, um, if you know from their perspective. Um. Um, well, I, I think that um, it's a really good question to ask, Alex, because actually um, the evidence demonstrates that increasingly audiences don't necessarily think it's a particularly meaningful distinction um, from uh, from what I can see. And I think this is something that's become uh, uh, much more apparent with the rise of social media, where again, we, we've seen that, that line very much blurring. So I think that the distinction is extremely important for journalists in terms of understanding professional practice, but I think that it is less salient to audiences. And I think that that's actually a very significant observation. Thanks, Karen. Nikki, did you want to come in on this one? Yeah, um, I mean, I can't point to any concrete evidence on it from my perspective. I mean, anecdotally, you know, my in my experience, um, broadly, our audiences do see the difference across this spec I mean certainly between the research papers and the non-research papers and we're very careful to always try to demarcate these things from one another um, um, and you know this comes through in multiple ways but like it's a really important thing that we're always trying to, to navigate um, but you know, I do, I, I am aware that like with some of say our perspective content, which is still peer reviewed content, but still large, is always peer reviewed, but is it has an expectation of having a lot more opinion and argument in it than our review content, narrative review content. You know, I'm aware, you know, I, I mean, I got a reviewer comment recently on a piece that was like, well, but it's only a perspective. So like, I don't think it matters. You know, like there is a kind of understanding that this, that, that thing is very much in a, you know, well, I'm laying out a case for you and it's going to be like my view and you can believe it or not. Um, but yeah, so I think on the whole they do, where I start seeing interesting blurring of this sometimes though, is with some of the work we get that sits in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a space somehow. I mean, we have a lot of problems with demarcations between these, right? And in practice, it doesn't really fold out that well. And you often find and, and particularly more towards the humanities and certainly in the social sciences than we would obviously see in say chemistry, that there is more of this, it, it, it's a bit more movable. And how do we think about where, where it really falls between these buckets sometimes can be challenging. I think we're getting better at asking ourselves these questions, but I think having to recognize where the researchers also view it. Like, do they view some of these things as coming more out of a primary research space or more of an opinion space? And how do we then reflect that? That's been very critical work for us to think through and engage, you know, and it's a job of engagement and discussion with the academic community. Um, because I think we're mostly, again, the history of nature comes out of natural sciences and we approach it with a very different lens than people in, in social science and humanities. And with as we do more in those spaces, we're trying to get better at thinking about it and, and how to navigate. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, Alex, you had your hand up. Do you want the last word? We're coming up to three o'clock. No, 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 it's fine. I was going to follow up on that, but uh, I can see we're coming up to three o'clock. So I don't have a pithy last word for it. <laughs> oh, OK, well, maybe the one one thing I might then say is perhaps um, the, as Nikki was saying, it's sometimes down to the researchers themselves and their own reflexivity about the, where they are on that spectrum. And I wonder if we could maybe imagine a world where we're much more um, upfront, both when we publish, but also when journals are communicating with researchers about literally maybe where you are on that spectrum, you know, having a little arrow that you are forced to move along and say, this is where I am and this is where I should be. Maybe we just need to be as overt as that to force us all to think about it. 
Thanks for letting us finish off on that uh, on that note. And uh, please join me in thanking the panel for a really stimulating uh, afternoon. Uh, I think that's been fascinating and well worthwhile. Thank you for your questions. I'm delighted that I didn't get a chance to uh, ask any of mine. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you at the next UK Reproducibility webinar in, in a month or so's time. All right. Thank you. Take care.